Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Every year, we converge here in this beautiful city of Delhi. We take stock of our progress towards achieving sustainable development and to continue our quest for the elusive formula needed to remedy the associated challenges, including that of climate change. But such a mission would seem impossible if we are not willing to accept that these remedies will come with costs and must call for sacrifice. In other words, we want our pie, but are also eating it at an ever increasing rate. But ladies and gentlemen, the law of balance does not allow that. Dr. Bachari, Director General of the Terry, Dr. Ramachandran, Chairman of the Governing Council of Terry, our esteemed Chairman, Ambassador Deskupta, my fellow uh, presenters, uh, uh, President of Guyana, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings to you all. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the, the opening address by His Excellency Prime Minister of India and the comments already made by uh, Dr. Bachari and our chairman. Once again, I am deeply honored and grateful for the opportunity to address the 2013 session of the Delhi Sustainable Development Summit. Not only is it a pleasure to meet old friends again and to make new acquaintances, but I think more importantly, it provides us with the opportunity to interact as like-minded people to deliberate on humankind's ongoing quest for solutions to ensure the survival of our planet and in that of humanity. <clears throat> we would not be here today if we did not believe that the value, in the value of continuity of life on Earth, and that it is under serious threat. I have no doubt that we all agree that these threats are global in nature, and that their solution calls for collective global action. That the only way forward to make any progress in addressing these challenges is by acting together as one global family. But sadly, sadly, in spite of our ongoing rhetoric, we have, up to this moment, remained unable to achieve what we set out to accomplish, simply because it has not been convenient. But giving up the quest is not an option, because the future we want for our children and our children's children is at, it's at stake. In June last year, as, at the historical Rio Plus 20 conference, the world defined and produced the Future We Want document to advocate a stronger case for sustainable development and to propose the way forward to saving the world from the chains of unsustainable and selfish rates of development. In the 20 years since the Earth Summit of 1992, the future we want has now become the most important guide in much of the ongoing discussions on, de on sustainable development, including those that will take place here at this summit. But once again, as we have done with the holy texts, we will, as individuals, and as nations have our own interpretations of the future we want. And I believe that herein lies the secret to our inability to make progress on this very critical debate. Since we usually come on board the debating stage with our own predetermined mandates based on our individual national priorities as determined by our by our respective governments. We are consistently repeating the mistake of believing that the ongoing discussions, negotiations, 
on global challenges such as sustainable development and climate change are just another opportunity to protect and to ensure that our levels of gross domestic product are not put in jeopardy by any remedies proposed or binding agreements concluded to address these issues. The future we want will unavoidably call for a frank assessment of our international decision-making structure. It requires bold but rational political commitment on a global scale. We must be brutally honest in accepting the reality that unless and until we can sit at a single cabinet meeting table to deliberate on the future we want for our planet and our future generations, the prospects for success are bleak indeed. Once again, I pose the question, whose interests are we pursuing? Are we here to secure the future of each other's children or just our own? We no doubt agree, all agree, that humankind is a highly complicated species with the capacity to do immense good, but also with the capacity to do unimaginable evil. History has time and again demonstrated how true this has been. As we recall the wonderful deeds of sacrifice of such personalities as Mother Theresa of India, visionary and courageous leaders such as Mahatma Gandhi, but at the same time, history has witnessed and will forever condemn the horrors which are a product of bad leadership. Today, we stand at the crossroads in history to be judged by our action or our inaction as leaders and citizens in addressing these critical challenges facing humanity on a global scale. <clears throat> I believe that the future we want must acknowledge and address the special needs of those at the extreme end of the vulnerability scale. Countries like Kiribati, the Maldives, and other small island states grappling with the challenges of climate change while at the same time struggling to meet their Millennium Development Goal commitments. For countries on the front line, of climate change, of the climate change challenge, sustainable development and climate change are inseparable. Our uncertain future is a clear and a very loud statement on the urgent need for resolving the debate on sustainable development. It is testimony of what we as a global community have failed to do. Even at the risk of repeating myself, I would like once again to refer to the initiative of my country in closing off 400 square kilometers of our own, of our exclusive economic zone from commercial fishing activities. The Phoenix Islands Protected Area Paper is our contribution to global oceans conservation efforts, which has now been listed as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Following on from that, in 2010, the Pacific Ocean Scape was adopted as a regional initiative of the Pacific Island nations. In, in 2011 and 2012, other Pacific countries, including the Cook Islands, New Caledonia, Tokelau, Australia, and the adjoining Pacific waters of the United States have since been designated as marine protected areas as, as components of the Pacific Ocean Scape. At the Rio Plus 20 conference, the World Bank also launched the Global Oceans Partnership Program thereby adding momentum to what began as a small national initiative. The momentum is growing as more countries in the Pacific and indeed in other parts of the world are considering making similar commitments. My point in raising this issue is twofold. The first is simply to demonstrate that establishing such global conservation initiatives are indeed achievable. The second is to note that this has been achieved without prolonged and contentious negotiations. The most important question challenging us today at the summit is whether our ongoing efforts in addressing the issues of sustainable development and climate change remain relevant or indeed 
effective. From the perspective of a small island but large ocean state like Kiribati, my answer would be no. The next question is, what are the chances of positive progress being made in concluding an agreement on climate change? Very little, I would answer. So the next question, so do we perish as a species? Ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you some of the thoughts which have flashed through my mind in moments of frustration and, frust and desperation. And I do take full personal responsibility if they may come across as being a little radical and perhaps unrealistic. I dream of having a broad, without details, a broad agreement on issues over which there is consensus being based on science. I believe we all agree that no one wants to destroy this planet. Based on bro this broad consensus, I believe we could examine existing international agreements with the objective of adding climate change and sustainable development components where there are none, or giving greater force to those clauses drafted by those visionary people who at the time had no conclusive information on the, on the, on the challenges of climate change that we know, that we now know today. Existing international arrangements in maritime transportation, for example, have provisions dealing with polluting of the marine environment, but none restricting the continued use of inefficient marine engines to set acceptable levels of greenhouse gas emissions. We, in the Western Pacific, uh, Western and tuna, and central tuna fishery in the Pacific, as Pacific Island country parties to the Nauru Agreement, have unilaterally set some conditions of access to our exclusive economic zone, which may not conform strictly with the existing provisions of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, but which we believe to be very much in the spirit of UNCLOS, which enshrines the principle of protecting the commons. I believe that we take, if we take the opportunity to, to scrutinize our other international agreements in trade, aviation, and others, we may well find a pathway which may be less contentious than the current UNFCCC negotiations. As I said, these are just desperate propositions, born of desperation and frustration. But I nevertheless challenge all of us here, especially Terry, to give it a look. But I do take full responsibility if it does turn out to be a silly proposition. Mr. Chair, I look forward to the discussions that will unfold here today in the next few days of the summit. But before I take my seat, I want to take this opportunity to thank Terry, the Board of Directors of the Council, and of course, Dr. Bachari for remaining faithful to the course and maintaining pressure for solutions. I also want to extend, to extend my gratitude to the government and the people of India for the warmth and the kind hospitality extended to us, and I'm sure all of us, since our arrival in this great city. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I wish 20, the 2013 Delhi, Delhi Sustainable Summit deliberations every success, and I extend and share with you all our very traditional blessings of the Maori, the Rai, Thank you.